Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Central is a place to learn and grow. For children. For youth. And yes, even for adults. Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. you're here we have some information and a small gift about life here at Central so uh, again welcome and hope to see you again very soon and if you're on the center aisles tradition here at Central are those uh, brownish pads called friendship pads just please sign into those uh, let us know if there's anything we can do for you during the week and then pass them to the outside aisles and back you'll get to know a little bit more about your your worshiping neighbors today several announcements and we'll try to go through these relatively quick First of all, today is a two cents a meal collection day. So after the services, there will be folks at the exits of the sanctuary with cans. You can deposit your coins, your contributions. Again, this is a project here at Central where every meal we have during the week, we're asked to throw two cents into a kitty and uh, bring that at the end of the month. And uh, it goes towards our Shepherd's Supper program, which is a, a meal for the community on Thursday nights. This is annual conference week, begins Thursday up in Syracuse. Uh, please keep all the conference members in your prayers. But Pastor Mark, um, Sarah Hungerford, and Allison Clock will be representing Central at annual conference, a very important event in the life of a United Methodist. Next week will be Confirmation Sunday. Four from our church will be confirmed, wonderful thing. Uh, again, that's next Sunday during the 11 o'clock service. Not in your bulletin today, but it will be next week, I'm told, is a final, emphasize the word, final word, uh, parsonage cleanup over at the parsonage towards the back of the sanctuary on Thursday, June 5th, starting at 10 o'clock. So please uh, contact Carolyn Sanford if you can help out with that or just show up. I'm sure they'll put your, your hands to good use that day. And uh, we hope that Pastor Michelle and her family be moving in sometime in the middle of June, I understand. So this will be our final, final take to uh, make it perfect for her uh, arrival. Two weeks from today, believe it or not, is June 8th. Hard to believe. Um, church picnic is that day. It's going to be in the Liberty Street parking lot area. There's a chicken barbecue sign-up in the bulletin today. Please use those sign-ups and and throw them in the offering plate a little later in the service. Uh, Pre-orders are definitely uh, desired for that. If you haven't noticed in the AV, I call it the playpen back there right now because it looks like one, uh, there's a video presentation giving you a little bit better perspective of what to expect uh, for the new AV 
uh, facilities that we're going to have here in the church. So it takes about three minutes to see the whole thing. If you just want to stop by and look at that after, uh, it would be very interesting for you, I'm sure. Next Saturday is a very, very busy day here. Uh, everyone should find something to do here at church. First of all, there's a blood drive from 8 o'clock till 1, right down at Fellowship Hall. Always uh, a popular event here and much needed by the Red Cross here in Broome County. So if you give blood or would like to give blood, uh, just show up down there and they'll, they'll lead you through that process. Again, 8 to 1 down at Fellowship Hall. We have two minute speakers. I'm going to call on Bill Carmine for the first one. Good morning, everyone. We still have a little room out there in the garage for you to bring your stuff that we're going to con convert into treasures for our neighborhood. And we still have a few lines out there on a chart in the Welcome Center where you could sign up to help on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And for all those who want to come to the garage sale, Friday from 9 to 1 and Saturday from 9 to 1, find some treasures that you didn't even know we had. And also, you can get your car washed and you can get a sub sandwich all from this church. Garage sale. Deep this year, folks, and I came up with nothing. <laughs> nothing. But you can look at my silly face. How's that? That's that's good. Anyways, next sun Saturday from 10 o'clock, it says 9 o'clock in the bulletin. Please make that correction because we won't be able to get our act together by 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock to 1, there'll be a car wash in the Liberty Street parking lot, just like Bill said, by the car wash. There's also sub sandwiches, ham and turkey subs made by uh, Jim Romas down the street here, uh, $5. All proceeds from the car wash and the uh, sub sale go towards the van operating fund. So we really appreciate your support. Keep those cars dirty this week. Just come on down and get them washed and grab a sub. It would be a good time. Are we ready to worship for real now? Okay. Our first reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of Acts, beginning at the 22nd and then later the 29th verse. Please hear this reading. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here ends our first reading. Join me in prayer. O oh God of compassion, we come to worship even in the midst of a world with much cruelty. We gather to once again proclaim the good gospel of Jesus Christ and dare once again to speak words of truth and love in daily life. We gather to witness, O oh God, to your works of love, mercy, and compassion that guide us today and that will triumph in the end. We pray, we affirm your works in our lives. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. It's a choir that was lovely. I'd like to invite the children to come join me for a few moments. Well, good morning and welcome. 
And I see we have some um, folks who have returned to visit for today. We're glad you're here. I brought something with me today. I wonder if any of you have seen one of these. You know what this is? What is it? That is a boomerang. And what's special about a boomerang? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always supposed to come back. That is true. If you know how to throw a boomerang, which I, obvi which I don't, you throw it and it will spin around and around and come back to you. I had one of these when I was a little guy, and the first time I took it out in the woods, I threw it, and it didn't come back to me, and I never found it. I don't know what happened to this day, and it had nice bright red on the tips, so I should have been able to find it, but it, I, I watched it go right down, and I don't know where it went. So, so anyway, yeah, so boomerang is supposed to come back to us. And the reason I brought this, because I think about the things that we say and the things that we do, because sometimes they come back to us. Like if we call somebody a mean name or don't treat them nicely, sometimes we find out that people are calling us a bad name or they're not treating us nicely. Or um, we say something mean about someone, and we tell, we tell a lie about them, and we find out later people are telling lies about us. I mean, that's not very good. But the good thing is that when we show God's love to people, and when we say good things about people, God's love comes back to us. So what we want to do is remember the boomerang and always do things that show God's love and God's good wishes for people. So not, and not just so we'll get something good back, but so the world is a better place where everyone is trying to do good things to show God's love to one another in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? We thank you, God, that when we show your love to others, your love comes back to us and helps us to show your love and your goodness even more. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you all. See you later. Gracious God, whose own son's term of service to humanity was so full that its brevity was no distress. We call to mind on this Memorial Sunday those who will not grow old as we who are left grow old. Those whose lives were too brief for us, but long enough perhaps for you. Forgive us that they died so young because we were too unimaginative, too imperious, too indifferent, or just too late to think of better ways than warfare to conduct the business of the world. Gratefully, we remember the generosity that prompted them to share the last of their rations, the last pair of dry socks, and to share in the course of one hour in a foxhole more than most of us care to share with one another in a lifetime. And we recall the courage that made more than one of them fall on the grenade, there was no time to throw back. Grant, O oh God, that they may not have died in vain. May we draw new vigor from past tragedy, buttress our instincts for peace sorely beleaguered, save us from justifications invented to make us look noble or grand and righteous, and redeem us from blanket solutions to messy, detailed problems. Give us the vision to see that those nations that gave the most to their generals and the least to the poor were throughout all history the first to fall. Most of all, give us the vision to see that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. We pray, O oh Lord, that your love may indeed wash over us Wash over this congregation, this community, indeed your world, 
so that those who need your presence with them will feel it. We have lifted up some names before you already. We pray for Barbara, for Karen, for Ray and Jack, for Karen, for Norma's family as they mourn her loss. We pray for all anywhere who are in distress or hurting this day, O Lord, that your spirit may come upon them and that they might experience true joy that comes from you, that they might participate in celebrations with Nancy and Carl on their anniversary, Dick with his birthday. Indeed, O oh God, through Christ our Lord, he came to be what we are so that we can be like him, and like him, we may find our way to you. For this we give thanks in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament. It's the book of John, chapter 14, verses 18 through 21. If you'd care to follow along, it's on page 109 in your pew Bible. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and in you, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. May God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of our scriptures this morning. Shall we pray? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I suspect we all know the basics of this Memorial Day. A federal holiday in the United States, a time to remember and to honor men and women who died while serving in our armed forces. Began after the Civil War uh, to commemorate all the soldiers who died in that war. Originally called Decoration Day because we decorate the graves with flags and so forth. By the time we got into the middle of the 20th century, it was a time of remembering all those who died in all of our wars, and the name was changed to Memorial Day kind of a lonely, melancholy time for those who lost loved ones in a war or for those who fought and remember fallen comrades, those who never came home. However, for most others of us, it's a time to make a passing nod at the evils of war, convince ourselves that there really is no good alternative to it, and then off we go to our holiday barbecue, lake, pond, or pool, with red, white, and blue. A time to do anything, anywhere, except work, because it should be a holiday. It's an easy day for most of us, but not so for those who feel the pain of loss, and holiday or not, relive it every year, over and over and over again. For them, the pain of loneliness and loss do not dissipate so quickly or so easily. Now, my thoughts today are not meant to be an anti-war lament or, you know, moaning and groaning about it, uh, other than I'll simply note that it's usually not generals and experienced military leaders who are eager to flex the might of arms. It's usually those who have not gone or experienced war. 
usually those who make decisions from places of safety and security who send others out into harm's way. And not to take anything away from the poignancy of Memorial Day, those whom we honor this day are well deserved of whatever honor we give them in thought and word and deed. But as I was preparing for this weekend, I was contemplating that loneliness and loss come to us in many ways, and it, they take on many different forms. Do they not? Death, illness, life circumstance, natural disasters, human-caused disasters brought about by selfishness, short-sightedness, and so forth. There is much around us that exposes us to hurt and to pain. And it's no secret that the church is located right where people hurt. I mean, we're not set apart. We're not insulated. We're not removed from that pain. We are in its very midst. And the hurting and aching souls intersect with the church constantly. We see them in the church office nearly every day. Almost every single day, day after day, week after week, they come in. Up against hard numbers, needing something, usually money, but just just to get by for day to day, just today, if I could just have this much to get me through today, We see the pain and the strain in their eyes. We see them as well Thursday evenings at Shepherd's Supper. We see them throughout the week at the clothing center. And the congregation itself, our congregation, every church congregation, is filled with people dealing with our own loneliness and despair. Are we not? Churches... Church members and and church friends, we're we're not immune. We all have issues and problems that work to stumble us and stymie us. They go to bed with us. They wake up with us. They go to work with us. They go to school with us. Yes, they even come to church with us. But yet, they don't cripple us. Despite all that works against us, we in the church continue to move forward in concern and service to our community and to the world in which we're placed. How can this be? How can this happen? Why do all these problems and issues not make us self-centered and self-absorbed? How easy it would be. There was a Dutch priest, he died in 1996, his name was Henry Nouwen, and he wrote, he was kind of a a spiritual contemplativist, and he wrote a number of books, but the one in particular uh, was The Wounded Healer, The Wounded Healer, maybe that's his best known book, and what he does in the book is he, he says, we look at the suffering in our own hearts, and then we make that the starting point. For our service, we heal from our own wounds, hence the title of the book. That, we, we take that which hurts us, we use it to heal others, and we use it then to heal ourselves. Well, how can that be? It's not true just because now one says it. I mean, I agree with him, but where did he get this notion? Where did it come from? For that, we turn to Scripture. The book of Acts, written a couple of decades after Jesus' death, the Apostle Paul now stands in front of of the Areopagus. It's a hill in Athens near the Acropolis. In uh, Greek, it stands for the the hill of Ares. In, uh, In Latin, for those from Rome, it was Mars Hill, the ancient gods of war. 
the, the ruling council met on this hill. Later it became where the courthouse was. So it was kind of like our courthouse square. It's where people who had something they wanted others to hear would go and they would speak. It was an important place for public pronouncements. And so Paul, in this risky address, criticizes the Athenian gods. He says, because he is not from, from Athens, remember, nowhere near there. So he says, I've come to Athens, I've been looking around your town, and I see that you all are very religious. I saw artistic uh, idols and images of, oh, of gold and silver and of stone. And he says, I saw an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. To an unknown God. And Paul says to them, you know, you don't know your God. But I and my brothers and sisters of the way is what the early Christian community was called, followers of the way. He says, we know our God. What you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you as the God who created everything of heaven and earth. And this God does not, cannot live in idols and images. And he continues, in raising a man, that is Jesus, from the dead, God has shown us that we, uh, you, all of us, he says, we are all offspring of God, and in this God we live and move and have our being. That was his message to the people of Athens. Well, despite everything that Paul went through, all the difficulties this new community of faith was having as it struggled to find itself, the number of times that Paul risked his life for Christ, even though he was preaching on foreign soil to an audience that was less than receptive. I mean, he's going in there and telling them they were worshiping wrong. In the midst of all that, he proclaims the fundamental truth that all of creation and everything that's in creation are in God's circle. They are under God's care. The Gospel writer John puts it even more directly when Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. And because I live, you will live also. And you will know that I'm in God. You're in me and I'm in you. We are all part of that oneness. Jesus is saying in John, you will be alone no more. Despite the problems, despite the circumstances, despite the difficulties, the stumbling blocks, you will be alone no more. Yes, life is hard and unfair. I remember when my children were, would say to me, that's not fair. Yeah, well, it's not fair. Life isn't fair. Get used to it. But that doesn't stop God. That doesn't stop God. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist and director of the uh, Hayden Planetarium at the moment, and he admits at best he's agnostic when it comes to faith. That's as far as he will go uh, in that direction. And his thesis is the universe is out to kill us, basically. And he has this long list of ways of things that happen to us in, in nature, in the world, the universe is trying to kill us, he says. Well, who am I to argue with him? But the Christian confession, the Christian belief, the Christian certainty is that despite all that, true or not, despite that, the creating, redeeming, sustaining creator, God loves us and cares for us and wants each and every one of us to be in a right and a good relationship with God and with each other. And God wants us to be at ease in and enjoy the fruits of the good creation that is provided. And for the Christian, for the Christian, the resurrection is proof of that. The resurrection is proof 
that evil and death do not have the last word. We are not alone. No matter how lonely and bereft life circumstances can make us here and there and now and then and from time to time, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, we are God's and God is ours and we belong to each other. We can live in wholeness and in peace and shalom despite it all. In the risen Christ, there is wholeness and peace, shalom and healing for mind and soul, even if there isn't healing for the body. Some years ago, I was on our Board of Ordained Ministry for the annual conference. This is the group that examines persons who want to be pastors. And uh, we make the decision whether they should move forward or, or look in another life direction. And a woman came applying for ordination who had multiple sclerosis, MS. And this was a concern for us on the board because we didn't want to accept someone in who within a year or two would be so debilitated that she wouldn't be able to work. That wouldn't be fair to her. It wouldn't be fair to, to her churches. So we talked to her about it. And she said, my Christian faith, my God has healed me of the fear of MS. She said, I've been healed of the fear of MS. She was accepted and many years later is still serving very, very well. Being healed of the fear, being alone no more, healed so that with God in Jesus Christ, there is life, abundant life, life with enough to share, healed, so that the living of our life in Christ's love widens the circles of God's love and care so that no one need be alone any longer, healed, so that all would be enfolded within God's reconciling, rejuvenating embrace the healing of the Spirit. I had all these things on my mind as I was preparing for today, uh, knowing that we would take time in just a few moments to have a ritual of healing. Uh, Reverend Horace King is going to join me in just a moment, and we have some uh, healing balm, it's called. And any who would like to come forward uh, to receive that, we would be delighted to uh, anoint you. If uh, you would like to kneel at the rail, you can do that, uh, or just stand in front of us. Uh, normally, uh, the sign of the cross is made on the forehead, but if you'd prefer, just uh, put your hand out and, and we'll know that you would prefer it there. Uh, the ushers are not going to direct you. This is uh, entirely on your own when you are ready. We would invite you to come and receive the healing of the Spirit of Christ so that you might go forth knowing that indeed you are not alone.